One of the biggest mistakes people make when they start learning NLP is they don't take the time to master the most essential model, the meta model. Mastering it will unlock the power of NLP for you. The meta model was the very first NLP model. It still serves as a nearly perfect example for all of the NLP models that have followed since. It holds the key to not only how NLP works, but also how we create our own reality. If you don't learn the meta model, you'll never fully understand what makes NLP so effective. As a result, you'll never be able to use NLP as effectively as you could. I will show you how the meta model works and how you can master it because when you do, you'll have greater influence over yourself and others to move beyond limitation. Now, this is not an entire, I wouldn't count this as a class that will teach the entirety of the meta model because the meta model has such depth that you could literally teach it for days. But this will give you a greater understanding, even if you've studied it already. One of the problems that we have with the meta model is it's usually not taught very well. The teachers themselves often don't understand how important it is, so they don't emphasize it that much. But with the proper training and people to practice with, you can start mastering it starting right now. Now, you might be wondering, where can you find that additional training and the people to practice with? In the description below, I will be referring to the PDF that you can download. You'll find it in the description. So go to the description, click that link that says meta model. I will be referring to that document. You should follow along with that. It'll help. Also, what you will see when you go to the description, there is something called the ultimate NLP practitioner training. This is a NLP training, an online training that I created based on a 24 day, 24 day live training that I did. So I created concurrently the live part of it while I was creating slides and everything that makes it more practical for an online training. And in that training, not only do I teach the meta model, I teach every aspect of what should be in a NLP practitioner training. It is extremely accurate. I don't mix anything else. I know a lot of NLP teachers like to mix a lot of other things, and it's hard to know what actual accurate NLP is versus the other stuff that they're mixing in. So it is fully accurate. It is fully NLP. That's not to my credit. That's to the credit of Steve and Connie Ray Andreas. The practitioner training is basically their material, their training. Of course, I got permission to do it, <laughs> permission to use their material. Also, when you enroll in that program, it is you do get access to a community of practitioners. So you have people to practice with. The best part of it all is we made it so inexpensive, so inexpensive that absolutely anyone can afford it. I highly recommend that you get that training if you're serious about NLP and you want to learn it, even if you've already had some trainings, most people uh, come to me and they say, I don't even understand what I got out of my training. That's what I focused on, making sure that it was digestible and easy to understand. Of course, the meta model is taught in that training as well, and it's really integrated into the training to make it easier and more practical. Now, NLP first started, like I said, the meta model was the first model, and NLP at this time was not even called NLP. It was called meta. So they named the first model, the meta model. Later, the name NLP came about. The idea was to create a model of models, acknowledging that we don't actually live directly with objective reality. We're actually living based on our model of reality. And the reason for that is because there's too much information coming at us all at once to make it understandable. So what we have to do is what any good map does is you have to create a map that is based in deletion, distortion, and generalization. Now, some of those things that I just mentioned sound bad. They're not actually bad. It's just a fact of our existence. This is how we perceive reality. We have to perceive it through a map because like I said, there's too much information coming at you. What they, under, what they understood early on when they were creating the meta model is that when we experience limitation, when we experience problems, we're not really experiencing limitation and problems in ourselves or in the world around us. We're experience, experiencing those limitations in our map of reality. And they base this on a presupposition by, I believe, the linguist Krzybski, if I'm saying his name correctly, that the map is not the territory. So when you think of a map and you think of the territory in which the map represents, the map and the territory are not the same thing. There would be no use for a map if they were the same thing. So we create a map to understand it better. And if you think if you are in the territory and you don't recognize where you are and you don't know how to get from where you are to where you want to go, this is what is useful about a map. 
you can have a map in your hands or you can have a GPS and the map doesn't recreate the territory. If it did, then it would be useless. It takes only what is needed from the territory to diagram how to get from point A to point B. So this is very a very good thing, but it can turn into a bad thing if in your deleting and distorting and generalizing to put your map of reality together, if it leaves out crucial pieces that are holding you back or an overgeneralization or a distortion that then gets into gets in your way and makes it feel like a limitation. So it is your map of reality that limits you or frees you to live the life that you want to live. I'm going to teach this in a way that I've never taught it before. And I'm going to refer to my trusty whiteboard. <laughs> okay, so here's, here's a portrait of a person. I think most people would look at this and say it's a smiley face, right? So what I want to focus on is how how deletion, distortion, and generalization works with something that's not language. So if, I, if you get this understanding, I think the language part of it is going to come a lot easier for you because I think that's where people get tripped up. Language, sort of like math, you're kind of a language person or a word person, or you're a math person or you're not, you're a language person or you're not. Don't let the language part of it scare you. A lot of people don't master the meta model. They skip past it because it's not uh, as sexy as some of the other NLP techniques. And like I said, you're really doing yourself a disservice when you do that. So let's look at this. What is it? Now, most of you are saying it's a smiley face. But if you think about it, this doesn't bear much resemblance to an actual face. You can see my face right now. And if you compare it to this, like let's imagine there was an alien looking down on us and could understand our language. And, and you said, well, this is a smiley face. The alien would be like, that doesn't look anything like an actual person's face. But we're able to look at this and still think that's what we think of. That's the meaning that we're creating of this diagram. So first off, when you look at my face and you look at this smiley face, is there anything that's been deleted from my face to this face? Yeah, a lot. <laughs> so my face, we could say, is the territory. That's my actual face, is the territory. The map would be this diagram here. So there's so much that's been deleted here, and yet you still recognize this as an actual face. The, there's no ears here, there's no nose. There's so much more detail that's just not here. So this would be this would be a deletion, or this would be many deletions that we're making here. Yet this smiley face still communicates to you a smiley face, even though so much has been deleted. In fact, I think if we deleted any more out of this, you might actually we could probably delete the circle. And if you just see those two dots in a, uh, a not even a half circle, a quarter circle, you would still probably say, oh, that's a smiley face. Yet we've deleted so much out of it. So this, how this is how this works. Now, distortion, distortion is when we get into certain things mean things when they actually don't. So cause effect, uh, what we call complex equivalence, also mind reading. These are all examples of distortion. So how can we relate that to this? Well, the meaning that you're making of this would be a distortion. If you look at this and you say, this is a smiley face, that's a, that's a distortion because it's so far removed from what an actual smiling face looks like. But this is the meaning that you're creating of it. So that, like I said, is an example of distortion. Generalization is uh, when we get into what we call universal quantifiers and modal operators. A universal quantifier is whenever something is absolute. Now, we could make generalizations about this, and I would even say in a more general sense, uh, no pun intended, that to, to look at this and say this is a smiley face is in, a, is in effect a, a form of generalization, but it's not the kind of generalization that we refer to in the meta model. 
And the meta model, the generalization is going to be around, like I said, the modal operators and the sort of absolute statements. So, you know, if you said this, all of these diagrams indicate a person who is happy, uh, that would be an indication of a, of a type of generalization. And so this doesn't fit perfectly, but the reason why I wanted to show this to you is to give you an understanding of the map versus the territory. Now the smiley face communicates something. That's what it does. It's not an actual face, obviously. So it communicates a happy face. And that would be representative of our language. What is our language communicating after we've made the deletions, dis distortions, and generalizations? So for example, if I say apple, <clears throat> you probably represented an apple in your mind. You hear the word, you know what it is, you make a representation of it. Your representation in your mind is going to be different than my representation in my mind. But how I was able to transfer that information was through language, which is a model that has deleted out, distorted, and generalized all of that information into sounds that I say, two syllable sounds, apple. And I say that, and immediately you connect with what I'm saying and you know what I mean. So we're using, we're using a model of reality, not reality itself, to communicate. Language is only about 150,000 years old. And when I found that out, I was kind of surprised by that. And if you think about when language was first created, when we started naming objects, and then we started using grammar to sort of string these words together to create stories and meanings and how-tos, like how to get to one place to the next or how to hunt for an animal or something like that. It's quite likely, and I don't know this for sure, but it's quite likely it was very literally based. Like the thing was the thing and we didn't likely have jokes and humor right away that we could make in language. And part of what humor is and things like sarcasm uh, and many other, other forms of humor in a sense is, especially puns, a sort of a dance between the disconnect between language and the actual territory. If I went to an event and everybody around me could see, could see that I was really not enjoying myself. And then I said, gee, I really enjoyed that. People might laugh because they know I don't mean that literally. The language itself is, even though it's there to represent the actuality, it actually contradicts the actuality, which makes that humorous. So this distance from language from the, ter language from the territory or reality is actually part of how we create humor. And it's an acknowledgement of that difference. So let's get into the, the language part of it. So this is where I'm gonna get into the PDF. I like to start off with deletion because it's the easiest one. So when people are speaking, they're, we are, we're always deleting information, right? Because what we're saying does not 100% represent the territory, like I said, if we did, it would make language obsolete. So for example, if we didn't have language, in order for me to get into your head what I'm saying, like the word apple, I couldn't say the word apple because it would delete out too much information for you to understand what I'm referring to. I would have to show it to you physically. But the beauty of language is I don't have to do that. I can just say some sounds that you recognize you represent that in your mind and you go, oh, okay, you know, I know what Damon's talking about. So deletion in our language is necessary, but what happens when we delete out too much information or we delete out the good information that we need to access? What the meta model does is we, it, we train ourselves to recognize what we call these meta model violations like deletion. If you're, a, if you're a coach, you're listening to your client speak and they say something and you recognize it as a deletion, what you can do is then counter that deletion by asking a question. A question, of course, this is trained into the meta model as well. We give you questions to ask to counter these violations. When you ask the question to uh, get the person who's deleting the information 
to go back into their experience, sensory-based experience, to find that information and bring it back into their map of reality. And this is how we can solve problems. And this is how we can make our map more accurate. And this is really important to have a, an accurate map, a map that's full of resources and a map that's full of choices. But we, what we end up doing is we delete these resources. We delete these choices. We delete uh, the accuracy in our map of reality at times. And this is when it becomes problematic. So for example, simple deletions, it's using, well, let's, let's look at the definition here of deletion, the information we leave out of our map of reality so that we can focus and pay attention to what we believe is relevant and important information. So it's not by accident that you delete out information. Like I said, this, this is the whole point of creating a map. You have to delete some things out. The problem is, is when you delete out information that is quite useful. So in simple deletions, we're basically just using nouns, pronouns, adjectives, and verbs that are vague and not specific. So if I say he went to the big store, he, well, who exactly are we talking about? Now you'll, you'll say right off, I'm sure you'll be thinking, well, a lot of this is already implied and that is true, but sometimes, and you've had this happen to you before, you think it happened to my wife and I last night, we were talking about something. We realized we were talking about two different things, even though we were referring to it. She thought it was one thing. I thought it was some, I was talking about something different. And then once we realized that we weren't referencing the same thing, we started laughing. So if I say it, we often assume because of the context of the conversation, what I'm referring to, but I might be referring to something different. And so this is important. So he, in this case, he went to the big store. We don't know necessarily who he is and you might need that clarification and went, how exactly, how exactly did he go? Did he drive? Did he walk? Now, again, that might not be relevant, but it, it might be in some cases, if you like detective stories where you have really good detectives, even famous detectives who are investigating a crime, a lot of times there's a lot of implied things and everybody else misses it, but the detective has the trained mind to look for those things that are missing that other people think is normal and they catch because they, they know something here is being overlooked. So there's the how he went and then the big, well, you know, we kind of have an idea of what big means, but we don't know how big that is. If I say the big store, well, to me, if I didn't grow up around a lot of big stores, I might think what you think is a medium sized store is really big. And then of course, uh, as far as stores go, what kind of store is it? And like I said, uh, if you're practicing this with someone and you know, you're practicing, that's okay. You can, you can meta model things into oblivion and that's fine for practice. When you're talking to someone, whether you want to influence them or you're a coach or you're a therapist and you're, you're working with them to help them out and solve problems you're not going to want to meta model everything. <laughs> so anytime you recognize a deletion, you, just, you don't want to seize on it necessarily. You're looking for what is relevant, what is necessary, what are you noticing? And this again comes with practice. What are you noticing that this person is leaving out that could be really important? So you don't want to uh, put people through the third degree like they're in an interrogation. You'll break rapport with people if you do that. It, you need to be a little more gentle and a, a little more selective than that. And how do you do that is practice. There's no way of getting around it. You need to practice. All right. Then you have comparative deletions. These are quite common. I find I catch myself using them all the time and I even have to meta model myself and say, okay, well, what do I mean by that? So, uh, a comparative deletion is when the person or, or part being compared is missing. So saying something like she is better, better than what? And we hear this a lot when, in terms of superiority and inferiority. Well, I'm better than that person or I'm, I'm better or they're better. And we have to get more clear about what we're talking about better than who and, and better or better than what, what are, what are we talking about here? But you'll hear this in people's words all the time. They will just make a statement like that without connecting to the comparison. What is that being compared to? And that's important information because sometimes when you just ask that question, well, better than who or better than what, the person will go, they have to go back into that deep structure, pull up the information, and then they might realize 
that doesn't make a lot of sense. That person or that thing is not really better, maybe better in a certain way. So what we're doing is getting more specific, more detailed. And with more specifics and more detail, we can often have a lot more clarity. We can have a lot more understanding about what's going on. And sometimes that alone just solves the problem. And you could say she is better than who or what uh, to, to counter that. There's also something called an unspecified referential index. This is when the person doing the action is either completely left out or the reference to him or her is so vague that it's not obvious who is being referenced. Like they hate me. Well, how many people and who exactly hates you? And when the person has to go in again into the deep structure and recover that information, they might go, oh, okay, well, it's actually one person who doesn't necessarily hate me. They just dislike me. And so when you're able to pull all of this out on the table and look at it and, and more sensory based experience, then it, usually this stuff becomes a lot more obvious and a lot less painful or a lot less limiting just by bringing it out. The meta model is often known as the model where of details of chunking down, we're asking for more detailed sensory information. And so if we just live in our models and we forget that it's supposed to be attached to an actual territory, we can lose connection with that. And so as a result, we delete, and then we need to bring that information back in. There's unspecified verbs. This is when the action is too vague to know specifically how something was done. For example, he was beating up on me. What does that mean exactly? Is that a, is that a metaphorical thing or was that actually happening, like physically beating you up. This would be good information to know. Nominalizations are very interesting. This is when we convert verbs into nouns. And one way to differentiate true nouns and nominalizations is to ask yourself whether or not you can pick it up and put it in your pocket. These words are often, but not always, end in ION, like nation, intuition, procrastination, transgression, and words like love and government are also anomalizations. So for example, uh, this one example I give, I don't know what else to do with this creation. So creation is technically a noun, but you can't pick up creation, put it in your pocket and take it somewhere. It's a process. And so we want to turn it back into a process. So if we say something like, I'm, I'm frustrated by this limitation. If you think that sentence in your mind right now, go ahead and do that. I'm frustrated by this limitation. Limitation, technically, grammatically, is a noun. But where does that limitation actually exist? It feels real when you call it a limitation, when you make it a noun. But you can't actually pick that up and take it somewhere. It's more of a process. Then I would say to you, what is limiting you? And if you ask yourself that question, what is limiting me? Notice the difference in how that feels. Limitation versus limiting. You'll probably recognize right away that limitation feels like there's something solid, like it's an actual border, like a guard, something that's in your way, an obstacle that's real and tangible, but it's not tangible. It feels tangible because we're using it like a noun. But if you put it back into a process or a verb limiting, now it feels more flexible. Now it feels like something that I can change. And the more I understand about it, what's limiting me the more I can remove that limitation. Another one would be government. And I actually was arguing with someone who was NLP trained about this one. And they insisted that government was not a normalization, but it is a normalization because it's not really a noun. Sure, you can point to people and government buildings, but that's not really what government is. Government is a process of governing. But if we refer to the government as government, it does make it seem like there's me and then there's the government as if they're two separate things. Now, remember, I used to think a lot like this and it made me a little paranoid and I felt uh, a bit rebellious and a little anti-authoritarian because I would had this feeling of us and them. There's me and then there's a the government. And because I perceive those as two separate things, two separate objects, it can easily create conflict. But whenever I started learning this and I started thinking, okay, well, government is really governing and what makes that process possible is other people just like me who show up to an office and do governing tasks. 
when you think about it like that, you realize, okay, well, there's a, actually a real human aspect to governing and that changes things. And so now it doesn't feel like there's such a separation as me and the government. Now I feel a little more connected to the government. I have some influence, um, especially in a democracy. And I also have a little more empathy for the people who do show up and do those jobs, jobs that I probably wouldn't enjoy doing at all. <laughs> all right. So then we drop down to distortion and distortion is our ability to represent. I'll go ahead and write this down here too, because I feel like I haven't use my whiteboard enough. So there's distortion. And this is our ability to represent parts of our map different than reality as in creating what isn't actually there, like imagining a future event that hasn't happened yet or creating fiction. So again, I want to reiterate that these things are not bad, deletion, distortion, generalization. Without these things, we wouldn't be able to make maps, but more importantly, we wouldn't be able to make our map of reality. So these things are neutral. They're not bad. Don't try to not delete. Don't try to not distort. We're going to do it. If you want to envision something, if you want to plan something that hasn't happened yet, of course, you need to be able to distort. You need to be able to make up in your mind sort of a model of what that's going to look like. Uh, if you work with your visions, and I don't, I don't mean just fantasies, but like visions of what you want to create, that's a form of distortion. It's a very powerful form of distortion and a very necessary form of distortion. So we don't want to get rid of this. <clears throat> and one of the metamodel language patterns is mind reading, pretending to know what other people are thinking. And this happens a lot. So if you believe you know what other people are thinking or feeling or intending, this can limit you a lot from doing things that you would otherwise do, but you're afraid people are going to judge you for it. Now that's one way of looking at that. There's other ways to solve that problem, but you don't really know what people are thinking. So if I, if, like what I have here, my boss thinks I'm lazy. Did your boss actually tell you this? Well, no. So how would you know for sure that they actually think that? Now, I've coached a lot of men uh, in dating. And a big part of it was for them is just introducing themselves to someone, especially someone out of the blue, someone they don't know. And you you change the game a lot if you're willing to, when you see someone you find attractive, to just walk up to them and say hi to them and introduce yourself. The main thing was, is, oh, they will think I'm desperate or they'll think this or they'll think that. And the truth is, is you don't know how that person's going to think. So that's both, um, you know, distorting as in projecting into the future what's going to happen, but also pretending that you know what people are thinking. And I can't tell you how many times since I've learned this, that I assumed I knew what someone was thinking or feeling. And I decided, you know what, you know, I know about, I've been practicing NLP. I've been practicing the metal model. I'm going to ask this person what they actually think or feel. And I can't tell you how many times that I discovered I was absolutely wrong of what I thought that they were thinking or feeling. And I'm so glad that I, I took the time to ask. And this is especially important as a coach when I'm coaching people it's easy for me to make assumptions about what they're thinking or what they're feeling whenever I'm coaching them through a process. But I want to err on the side of not assuming that. I want to err on the side of, I, sh I should just ask them. And I do this all the time. I notice a person, some emotion coming up and I'll just say, what's happening for you right now? And I say it like that because I want to know what they're both thinking and feeling. And I can get more specific to that if I want. Say the person tells me what they're thinking, then I can say, well, how does that make you feel? Or if they tell me how they're feeling, I can say, well, wh what do you think about that? I don't want to, uh, and not only is that good for me to know specifically what they're thinking and specifically what they're feeling, but them expressing it often is them having to go into that deep structure, like I mentioned, like having to go back to the territory to explain this stuff rather than just making a bunch of assumptions and staying inside a limited model. They have to move out of that to gather more information, to be able to explain what they're thinking and to explain what they're feeling. Then we have the complex equivalence. This is when we equate things. So it's a statement or statements that imply that two things are equal or mean the same thing when there's no actual connection or truth to the statement. So something like she did better than me. I must not be meant for this. Well, then I would say, well, how does her being better than you at this mean that you're not meant for this? Again, when you ask that question and they have to explain it, 
they have to bring more information into it and they'll often realize, wait a minute, that's not exactly true. <laughs> there's not really a connection between those two. Anytime someone does better at something than you, that means you shouldn't do it. And then the person would have to go back and say, well, no, that doesn't actually mean that because if it did mean that, then I would limit myself in many, many ways. So them having to answer that question takes that limitation away. But if I didn't ask that question, they could stay stuck in that limitation that when some, someone does something better than me, that means I shouldn't do it. That would be a very limiting way to live your life. But again, a lot of people are doing that. They get stuck in this uh, complex equivalence and they're projecting it all around them to, for everything. And this is going to be severely limiting. So we want to break out of that. We want to break out of that by asking the question and adding in the information that determines whether or not this is true. And we will realize very quickly th there's nothing true about it. Then there's a the loss performative. And these are value judgments that leave out who's making the judgment. So the statement sounds as if it's a universal law, which is not true. I hear that I, I grew up with a lot of this. I was grew up around a lot of people. Uh, I grew up in the South where authority was to be respected. And for the most part, to some extent, I agree with that to this day. <laughs> but there are so many times people would just say this. They would just make a statement, a declarative statement, like this is how things are. This is how it is. And I wish I knew this back then to question it more and to push back on that because uh, and, and the best way to do that is to say, according to who? So if you say pol politicians are corrupt, you say, according to who? The statement, the person making the statement sort of is distancing themselves from it. They're not taking responsibility for it. They're saying it as if it's a universal truth. And if you listening to that, accept it that way, then you've just accepted a pretty drastic limitation on your map oh, then that's just how it is. And this is the tricky part of this. A lot of uh, narcissists will will use this kind of languaging, like it's just universally true. It's not me saying it's just universally true. But if you call them out on it and you say, well, according to who? According to who are all politicians corrupt? Or according to who uh, is all women bad or all men bad or you know any of those things? When you call it out and they have to put the the responsibility back on them, they're usually not okay with that anymore. And some people will be, some people will be like, according to me, and I'm like, okay, or at least they're owning it. <laughs> but you'll find that a lot of people don't. And so like, if you're in coaching and you're coaching someone and they make a statement like this, where there's what I call, what they call the lost performative, meaning no one is actually performing that statement or it's missing from the statement. And you ask that question, then they'll have to realize, well, no, it's really just me making that up that's not a universal truth. And if I'm making this up, then I can change it. And so it puts the, the that not only puts the responsibility back on them, but it puts the power back on them to change the way that they're thinking about this. And then we have presuppositions. These are statements or questions that assume that something must be true in order to the, for the sentence to make sense. Now, these are tricky too. We're kind of getting into the stuff where people use for uh, manipulation and influence. So an example of this would be, when are you going to start taking responsibility? Now, if you just answered that question as in, well, I'm going to start tomorrow. What did you just do? You just accepted the presupposition that you're not taking responsibility now. And that might not be true. But in order for that sentence to make sense, it assumes that you haven't been taking responsibility for anything. And again, that's probably not true. So uh, people can make these um, statements about themselves, and that's the, in the case if you're a coach, then you want to notice the presupposition that they're making and you want to challenge it. Oftentimes you will run into people who use presuppositions on you. Does it mean that they learned NLP and they, they learn how to manipulate people like this? Not necessarily. Plenty of people use this stuff uh, who have not learned NLP. NLP is just a model of people basically using these things. NLP didn't really necessarily create anything new. They just created, it was just created as a model or way of coding what people naturally do anyway. Now, presuppositions can be very uh, influential and they can be very manipulative. A lot of salespeople use them. And if they get used too harshly, oftentimes people will call them out. So they're usually, if somebody's good at using presuppositions, they use them very gently and very softly. So for example, whenever I would call people up, 
when I was an insurance agent, I wanted to get an appointment with them. I would get them to agree that a meeting with me was important. That was one step that it was important to meet with me, but they hadn't committed yet. And so I would say, does Tuesday or Thursday of next week work for you? Now, what does that, what, is, what does that presuppose? That one of them will work for the person that either the Tuesday or the Thursday will work for them. And if that flies below their radar, then they'll go ahead and commit to either the Tuesday or the Thursday. So that's a good presupposition there. And <clears throat> just because we use these doesn't mean we're all <clears throat> manipulative people. We're going to use these and we can use these in ways that help people as well. Cause effect. This is assuming that the logic that one thing causes another when there is no truth to support it. So for example, uh, every time I pick up the phone, a fire truck blares its sirens. I live uh, in Santa Cruz, California, and it's amazing to me how often I hear sirens and four fire trucks and there's no fires. And so this is actually <laughs> something that I have felt before that when I would go to pick up the phone and call someone, suddenly out of nowhere, uh, sirens would start blaring. That was purely coincidental. <laughs> there was nothing about me picking up the phone and intending to make a phone call that caused a fire truck to blow its sirens. But when we think of things that way, and we think of us, you know, we think that thought or we say it out loud, it makes it sound like that there's the world is conspiring against us, that the world is trying to make life harder for us. And that's not going to be very helpful. So we want to, you know, catch these things. And if you hear somebody saying something like that, especially if you're wanting to influence them in some way, you could say something like, do you really believe you have the power to make sirens blare just by picking up the phone? And of course, they're going to have to say, well, no, not actually. But it's amazing if these, um, if these things go unchecked, how they, they get into our mind and they limit us, especially when these things are unconscious. When they're unconscious, they will limit us more than, we, than when they're conscious. When they're conscious, we can call them out. And that's kind of what we're doing here with the meta model. We are calling out people's unconscious limitations in their map of reality and questioning them so that they have to go back into that deep structure and come up with more information to realize, no, in fact, that's not true. Or it, it dissolves some sort of limitation or problem because we're adding the necessary information back into your map of reality. And then we finally, we get to generalization and generalization is our ability. I should write this here. Generalization is our ability to map across known information into the unknown in order to learn and categorize. A good example of this is when we're younger, we touch a hot stove and it burns us. And so we make a generalization. All stoves potentially can be dangerous because they might be hot. So be careful around stoves. That's a very positive generalization to make. And most of our early generalizations are about ways in which we can keep ourselves safe because we're hardwired to survive. Now, if I overgeneralize that and say all stoves are dangerous, no matter what, well, now I've got a, a big problem. Now I've got a, a huge limitation. I probably can't cook because I'm too afraid that all stoves are dangerous. So that would be an overgeneralization. And then we could challenge that. If somebody said all stoves are dangerous, we'd say, have you never, uh, have you ever been around a stove and it wasn't dangerous? And of course they would have to say, well, yeah, okay, yeah, of course I have, right? Now you can undergeneralize things and you could say, oh, stoves might be dangerous. And then you end up burning yourself on another one. So it's about finding the right balance, right? And it's about finding the right balance of the generalization to say, okay, uh, I need to keep myself safe. I need to be cautious, not too cautious, and just cautious enough to keep myself safe and to protect myself. Forms of, generaliz of generalization, the two uh, that we use in the meta model is modal operators and universal quantifiers. And these represent the most glaring limitations in a person's model. And the, probably the two most important ones, if you're experiencing limitations and that you want to overcome. So moto operators are words that imply what the rules are, what must happen or what is right. So this is like what feels like rules of the universe, <laughs> rules of reality. But in fact, it's only a rule that you created in your map of reality, which means you can change it. So it's words like should, necessary, 
need to, have to, must. These are indications of modal operators. So when you hear people use these words or you catch yourself using these words, know that you're using a modal operator. Know that you are bumping up against one of your own boundaries, one of your own limitations, but only in your map of reality. So something like, I have to stick with this job I hate. That was one that I said very often in life. And then you can challenge that. You can say, well, what if you didn't? I remember a friend of mine who did not know NLP, did not know the metal model, actually questioned me on this. I was a, a bartender in New Orleans at Harris Casino, which I think is now Caesars Casino. I think Caesars bought it. I, I was really frustrated with the job because I'm one of those people who I like to feel like what I'm doing has real value and real meaning and making drinks one drink after another all night long just felt like factory work and I felt rather meaningless. And so I complained a lot about the job. And a friend of mine said, well, yeah, it sounds terrible. And he was sympathizing with me and he said, why don't you just go find another job? And I thought about that and I said to myself, well, yeah, why don't I? And then I realized being a bartender, you only have to work a few nights a week. So it actually allowed me a lot of freedom. Not only that, for just working a few nights a week, I made more money than say someone sitting behind a desk job making barely more than minimum wage would make. So I could work fewer hours and make more money. When I thought about it like that, the job didn't seem so bad anymore. And actually it freed up a lot of frustration, a lot of tension. A lot of my attention was going into tension and frustration. But when my friend asked that question and I had to think about it, why am I still at this job? Actually, I had good reasons for it. I, they just weren't part of my map of reality. So anytime you catch yourself saying, I need to, I should, that's when you want to catch yourself. I just recently watched somebody commented on one of my videos that I made years ago. I forgot that I made the video and I was teaching something that came directly from one of Steve Andreas's books. And that is you cannot choose something that is impossible. That's as simple as it gets. You know, I can't choose to do something that I can't do. I can't choose to speak Russian or Chinese because I don't know how to speak it. So I can't choose to do it right now. So you can't choose the impossible. But what we often do to ourselves is when we can't choose the impossible, we tend to add on, but I should. If I said to myself, I can't lose weight, usually what's followed by that, at least in your thinking or in your mind, is but I should. And that just layers a lot of extra tension on top of it. Adding on a should or a must or a need just adds a lot of uh, undue pressure and burden on you. And you can back that up and say, okay, if I can't choose what's impossible, one thing I can do is I can want something that's impossible. I can say, I want to learn Chinese or I want to learn Russian. Now, when I say that, that changes things. Now I don't get the should, I get the, okay, if I want that, how do I go about doing that? And that's a completely different way to interact with reality. That's a completely different feeling. It's, it feels so much more freeing. There's possibility here. There's potential here. So when we say, uh, I can't, but I should, you basically are locking yourself in to a little tiny space in reality inside your map of reality that it renders you rather immobile and unable to solve this problem. So change the can't to I want. And that's most of the time what will help when you run into a, a modal operator. If you say I can't, you say, well, what if you could? What would that be like? And then I've had people say, well, no, I really can't. And I would say, I understand. I, I'm, not, I'm not fighting with whether or not you can. I'm just asking you, what would it be like if you could? And when someone does that, they have to access new information that's on that's outside of that boundary. There's sort of like they're reaching over that boundary to see what's on the other side. And that's a great way to solve that problem. You can imagine going on the other side of that boundary and you go, wait a minute, is this boundary even necessary? If I can access in my mind, at least what's on the other side of this, then I can start to strategize how to get there, which makes the limitation obsolete. Universal quantifiers, these are those overgeneralizations that I was talking about. 
A universal quantifier assumes that something is absolutely true without exception. Indications of universal quantifiers are words like every, one, all, always, never. This indicates a limitation in one's map of reality. Upon challenging it, the limitation can be seen for what it is, imaginary. So an example would be, you never do what I ask you to do. And then you can counter that with, never? Is that absolutely true? What about the time? And then you can you can have a counter example there. Oftentimes, if you're a coach, you're going to encounter clients who use a lot of universal quantifiers, and that should just point you in that direction right there. They're telling you what the problem is right there. It's easy to recognize. If they're overgeneralizing this way, they're basically telling you, here's my, my limitation in my map of reality. Here's my boundary that I'm bumping up against. I told this story many times uh, when I was um, recently divorced and started dating all over again. Uh, I kept having the same kind of person. Uh, it seemed like every woman I dated was kind of the same. They were doing a lot of passive aggressive things and trying to control me and trying to manipulate me. And I could have easily made the generalization, all women are passive aggressive. Now, if I had done that, <laughs> I would have severely limited myself and would have conjured a lot of negative feelings towards women, which were just absolutely untrue. And I don't think I would be married today to the wonderful wife I have now if I had that attitude or had that thinking or just that limitation in my map of reality. And the, the dangerous thing about this is that because it's my map of reality, it feels like reality itself. That's that's what you're functioning from, from is that map of reality. That map of reality is always going to have limitations. The territory, the reality itself, does not have those limitations. Objective reality might have some limitations, but oftentimes we're not even aware of what those are because we're so limited by our internal, our, 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 the limitations of our map. So what I did in that situation, being a good NLP or and a good meta modeler, I asked myself, what if there was something I was doing that was attracting that kind of person, that kind of woman? This is where you're putting the, you're going back into the territory. I went back into the territory and considered some other possibilities. And so I decided to function from that, that this isn't all women like this. Maybe it's just some women are like this. And I'm doing something. I have a responsibility here that there's something I'm doing here that's attracting that kind of woman that's communicating to that kind of woman. You can take advantage of this guy. You can manipulate this guy. You can con control this guy. And when I did that, everything changed. Everything changed. It started becoming obvious what I was doing, how the women were being attracted to me that way. And eventually I could see it so well. And it was so obvious to me that if women like that came into my orbit, they recognized right away that I could see what they were doing and they just got away from me. Because if you're passive aggressive people, the last thing they want is to be called out. The reason they're being passive aggressive is because they don't want you to, they don't want you to realize that the aggressions you're experiencing are coming from them. Kind of an introduction to the meta model, but not just an introduction. I wanted to go at it from a, a different way and uh, show you with the smiley face. Um, how we're doing this. So you want to think of your reality as a map. And in order to find where those limitations are, the meta model is an amazing way to do that, to recognize it in yourself to, and through language. And, and this is the amazing thing about NLP and uh, why it's called neuro-linguistic uh, programming is because language is an incredible map of our reality. It's not the only map, but it's one of the, it's one of the major ones. And so we, we are experiencing problems in our map of reality, not reality itself. And when we can recognize this, then we can add resources, we can add choice, we can add more accuracy to the map so that we can remove limitations, live the life that we want to live, accomplish the things that we want to accomplish. A good analogy for this is not a metaphor, but an, an analogy. If you think about mathematics, mathematics is often called the language of science. Math itself is not a science. It's a way of coding elements in reality so that we can better understand our actual reality. So in that sense, very much like language, it is a model, a meta model of reality. It's just done with symbols and numbers. There again is that model. And 
mathematics, when mathematics isn't working or we can't solve a problem in mathematics, that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with reality or science or the objective, you know, world, objective reality. It's just that we haven't cre maybe created that aspect of mathematics that needs to then be created to solve that problem. But there's a difference between the map and the territory, between math and objective reality, between your map of reality and reality itself. The main thing you need to know is we are going to distort, generalize, and delete. It's both our superpower and the source of our limitations and our problems. What you want is a map of reality that is accurate, resourceful, and that has choices. You can go too far with any one of these, okay? So some people get on this trip where they are looking for supreme accuracy and truth. Just know that you'll never find 100% accuracy because a map is not meant to be 100% accurate. If, it, if, you, if your goal was to make a map 100% accurate, then you'd have to completely represent, represent the territory, meaning it's every grain of dirt, it's every uh, atom, on and on and on to the point where you've made the usefulness of a map completely obsolete. So it only needs to be accurate enough. It needs to contain the resources, which is really your internal resources. It needs to, con it needs to allow access. Your map of reality needs to allow access to your own internal resources. And sometimes our map of reality deletes those or overgeneralizes them so we don't have access to them or distorts them in such a way that we can't access them. So we have to be able to recognize this. And like I said, the whole idea of the meta model is to recognize this through language because language is such a powerful map of reality. It's probably our biggest map of reality. We also need a map, want a map with choices. Anytime we feel like we have no choice, know that that's a problem in your map, not a problem in reality itself. And what will bring your attention to exactly where those problems are is deletion. You're deleting choices out that you need. And of course, generalization and uh, distortion are always related to everything. What I mean by that is I remember I was having a conversation with Steve Andreas and when he pointed this out to me, I just, it was like one of those wow moments. I, I mentioned, he wanted to know what I knew. This was one of our first, actually it was our first conversation. He wanted to know what I knew. And so he said, tell me, you know, he started asking questions and I started explaining about the meta model, deletion, generalization, distortion, that all NLP is based on deletion, generalization, distortion. And I could see him nodding his head. I was getting it. And then when I finished what I was saying, and he said, and all three happen all simultaneously, even when you're only focused on one. And I was like, whoa, he's right. We're constantly deleting, generalizing, and distorting all at the same time. And that's a maybe a bigger conversation. <laughs> and that conversation can just go on and on and on. Uh, but just know that we're doing this all the time. Then the reason why we want to focus maybe on one or the other is because usually it's the problem is contained in mainly one of them. Uh, it can be, you can see the problem in other ones and, and, and the others as well, but the language, your, your language or someone else's language will bring, once you train this into your mind, uh, in the meta model, will bring your attention to where the problem is. Is it a deletion? Is it a generalization or is it a distortion that's creating the problem? Once you can zero in on that, you can then ask the right questions to counter that whether you're using this on yourself or using it with someone else. Like I said, the training that I provide and the ultimate NLP practitioner training has the entire meta model with practice. And I go in depth and what it is and how to use uh, each um, of the meta model uh, violations and how to counter them with questions. And like I said, when you sign up for that training, you get people in a community to practice with. And that's what it takes. There's no way of getting around practicing the meta model. So I would recommend drilling it first. You really drill it by meta model, everything someone says into oblivion, just for practice with someone who knows what you're doing. You certainly do not want to do that to a friend of yours if they don't know what you're doing or to a client. You will break rapport. You will drive them crazy because uh, this can get very, um, it's actually, you can use a meta model very well in debates if you're debating someone because it really holds them to account and puts them on the spot. And so you don't want to do that to your friends. You don't want to do that to family members or uh, clients who you're working with. You want to be more gentle with it. So meta model into oblivion when you're drilling with a practice partner, but then when you're in real life, 
do it gently, know it's important, know where it's important for you to do the meta modeling and do it gently and do it in rapport.